Welcome to Theology on Tap. I'm your host, Pastor Jason, and I'm here with my co-host and partner in crime, Ben Schrady. Ben Schrady. <laughs> I didn't, ben Schrady. Ben Schrady. I was waiting for you to say, uh, yeah, you did. That. Worship and Creative Arts Pastor. There we go. And then we are here with our special guest, Dr. Oh, Renee Diamond. Pastor Jason, I'm here with <laughs> technical, this technical, it's all live. Um, Renee, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, your practice, um, your specialty, that kind of stuff? Sure. Yep. I'm a family medicine doctor. Um, I work at Iowa Specialty Hospitals and Clinics. I'm at the Garner Clinic, um, and I do primary care, full spectrum family medicine there. Um, um, to my path to medicine was, I guess they're all unique, but um, after college I went, took a year off and then I ended up going to medical school and in college like my interest for mental health stuff kind of peaked early. I worked with a professor who did, who studied depression and the gene expression in various models of depression. So I feel like it kind of goes way back. Okay, so gene expression, a, a term that many of us have heard over yes. and over again. Um, well, and here's why we brought uh, Dr. Diamond on. Do you want Dr. Diamond, Renee? No, what do Renee. you want to say? Renee. This Renee. is why we brought Renee on. Originally, uh, the topic for this month was actually going to be on the Bible and suicide. And we've had several conversations and questions about that because it's something that has impacted a lot of people. In fact, recently, it impacted our community here in Clear Lake. Um, but with COVID and all the stuff that's taken on there, mental health is becoming even more prevalent issue. Mm -hmm. So we decided instead of focusing just on suicide, we're actually going to talk about the Bible and mental health as a whole. Well, here's the deal. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and last time. Not you're, yet. Not, a, yes. not, not yet. Depends on the day. But Depends. once my experiments are complete. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. no. And so. I can talk about from the spiritual side. I can talk about the Bible. And, and here's the deal. The Bible actually doesn't talk a lot about, about mental illness sure. or mental health stuff. There is some evidence of it there. Um, so I figured it'd be better to bring on somebody who is trained and qualified more than we are. And I realize there's specialists and people yeah. who deal with this, but you're yeah. a doctor. And the nice thing, I mean, family medicine, like every visit, we all bring our own backgrounds and beliefs into all of our medical issues and to talk with your doctor, hopefully, or you should feel comfortable doing so. So I end up having a lot of conversations that are sprinkled or flavored with mental health topics, um, yeah. whether on the periphery or dead, you know, dead center. Um, okay. And, and part of the reason why we also wanted to talk about tonight is, let's just be honest, Christians haven't always done the best job when it comes to mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do believe there are two sides to this. There is a spiritual side, a biblical side, but there's also a medical, biological, neurological side that needs to be talked about. And I can tell you from my own experience, uh, I've witnessed firsthand some of the unhealthiness that comes from within the church because we don't understand the mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I like to talk about it, and this actually happened to my wife and I, my wife suffered from depression for years. And she's very open about it, so I'm not saying anything out of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a mentor in my life who, when I shared her mental health issues is before we got married, he said, what you, it is unbiblical for you to marry somebody who's taking medication. Wow. And again, I'm young. I'm, I think I was 25, 26. And this is somebody I deeply respected. Um, numerous times we had people that when we were sharing Lisa's struggle with depression, things were, well, you just need to pray more. Uh, we had one family, one pastor who said, well, the, the issue is tithing. You're not tithing enough. Um, and mental health is obviously far more than depression. We deal with anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism spectrum disorder, eating disorders, uh, PTSD, ADHD. I mean, there's a wide list of things. Yeah. And I think it's important that we have a theological but also a neurological, biological conversation around an issue that, quite frankly, is a very real problem today. Right. Um, recent studies, and this is from NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Health. Here are some statistics that were pulled from 2018. I know that with COVID and quarantine, these numbers have gone up. Uh, there's yeah. all kinds of proof of domestic violence, suicide. There's been a few mm -hmm. suicide cases because of loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is from 2018. Uh, one in five adults will experience some form of mental illness in their life. One in 25 will have a severe mental health issue. 17% of youth, six to 17 years, will have some sort of mental health issue. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death of people ages 10 to 34. Mm -hmm. 
It is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and 46% of suicides are people who have been diagnosed with some sort of mental health issue. Uh, and there are a lot more statistics on top of that. So this is a real important issue. Yeah. And this is going to be a little bit different theology on tap than in the past. We're not going to debate whether or not mental health is, it is an issue. It is. Yeah. But we do want to talk about, from a biblical perspective, medicine, because um, some people have questions, is it okay for Christians to take medicine? Um, what is, uh, at what point does it cross from spiritual to biological? And, and we see there's demon possession in Scripture. Uh, in the world of the Bible, there was no clear understanding. They didn't understand mental health. They certainly didn't have the DSM-5. <laughs> That's the diagnostic manual for uh, in dealing with mental health issues. And in churches, and imagine you have this, somebody breaks their arm. No one goes, hey, let's just pray about it and don't worry about going to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Well, there are those. That there do. are, but let's, let me rephrase sure. that. Most common, when somebody breaks their arm, most Christians will say, hey, you should probably go to the doctor. Still pray, because I still believe God can Absolutely. heal. But when somebody has a, a mental health issue, because we can't see the brain, yeah. Our tendency is to minimize it or say things like, well, everybody experiences having a, a day feeling blue. And I think, I think because unless you have a personal struggle with a mental illness, and one in five adults, like that statistics is 20%. Definitely, definitely par for what I would expect a statistic to say. I, think, I feel like that's very accurate. But I feel like unless that's been your story or someone very close to you and you've been very much part of their story and helping them through that, I think the reason that many Christians and non-Christians alike will give a sort of pat answer about, oh, just do this, is that, like, it's, it's simple. Like, but the solution for breaking your arm, the solution for anything, like, the multifaceted approach is generally going to be the best. Yeah. And, it, and it's the solution for every different arm fracture is different than every for every different mental disorder. Yeah. So when we have a person who comes in and they're truly struggling with a diagnosable mental condition, like there are a lot of things that can help. Medicines being one of them, exercise being one of them, diet being, like, there's lots of approaches, but when you're not comfortable, you just want to say something easy yeah. that's, that's nice, and, you know, and get away from it because it's not comfortable. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and, and it is... Um, I had, I had a friend of mine who worked in law enforcement, and he said more people are afraid of being cut than they are being shot because all of us know what it's like feels like to be cut. But most people have never experienced being shot. And so, yeah, they're afraid of a gun, but they don't have a frame of reference mm -hmm. for a gunshot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every person has a frame of reference from like a paper cut, right? <laughs> and so the first instinct rea instinctual reaction when you, ex when you understand something is to empathize. Well, unless you've had a mental health issue, it's hard to empathize with the difference between I'm feeling sad to I'm clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. Or um, I've, I, I had a Christian friend who was schizophrenic mm -hmm. and he would talk about when he was off his medication oh. and the voices he would hear and mm -hmm. the things that he would see. And, and, and I actually, I, I wanna, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I, I wanted to read. And, and Renee, I'm so appreciative of you being here today. Um, one, because I think you can speak on a level of experience and knowledge that simply we just can't. And quite frankly, shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. And I don't think, we, and I think it's important that, um, particularly for the church, there are some people who think that science and faith don't, are, are the opposites. They're at odds of each other, and they're not. Mm -hmm. They're two different realms. Mm -hmm. And the Bible doesn't talk to science, and science doesn't talk to faith. But it doesn't mean that they're opposing. They can be, especially mm -hmm. when you have unhealthy conversations or people that are more militant in their views. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's it's to bridge that gap, and this is why I appreciate you being on as a Christian, as a Christian doctor, or a doctor who is a Christian, mm -hmm. you, you have a unique perspective on this. And there's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I, I think would be helpful for us to hear. It says, mental pain, this is C.S. Lewis, he was a well-known theologian and author, wrote Chronicles of Narnia in the 50s, 40s, 50s. It says, mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It is easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the mental health, because we're dealing with a topic that for some Christians is taboo or embarrassing, part of my hope today on Theology on Tap is for us to really kind of maybe touch into some areas 
for individuals that are struggling, mm -hmm. but also for some Christians who maybe are wrestling with the theology because faith does play a part for some people. Um, there are some fun sayings, and Ben, maybe you've heard ones or if you have, but here are some fun sayings that uh, Christians intend to say to be helpful that end up being very hurtful. <laughs> uh, here's some, just three of my favorite, and if you have any, I'd love to have you say them. Uh, first, fix your eyes on Jesus and just stop worrying. Because Jesus says be anxious, or Paul says be anxious about nothing but in prayer and supplication approach all things. That's helpful for somebody who is dealing with an anxiety disorder. Um, my favorite is just pray, tithe, worship, go to church, join a small group. If you did more of those things, then you'd feel better. Check box. <laughs> check check box. Just check the box and you are good. And you're good to Done. go. And my all-time right favorite, my all-time favorite is just let go and let God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I've seen tremendous harm done to people that are suffering when Christians say statements and like this. I think this. the sad part about some of those responses, and, and just to speak to C.S. Lewis's quote, is that the, the common idea of, you know, when you share a joy, it's doubled, and when you share a burden, your, your burden is, mm. is decreased, is I think mental health things specifically are so isolating. Yeah. Because, and I love, like, right before we went live, we talked about how this conversation isn't starting about, like, let's make sure people know mental health is real. real. I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was like, is this a real thing? We don't know. Or whenever that shifted. Because you can't see it. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's even, like, it's that's why I think it's easier to admit that your tooth is, look, it hurts. <laughs> Here's my tooth. You know what yeah. I mean? But yeah. I've got something going on up here, and you can't see it, so I don't even know if you're going to believe me. Yeah. I think that, that immediately it, um, it, it builds a wall, it builds a barrier, because mm. uh, you can't see it. Yeah. Well, and it's that phrase, well, it's just in your head, and there's actually a truth to that. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it is. It is That's your... what I'm saying, <laughs> is it's in my head. So can you share a little bit, talk a little bit about the role of brain, of the brain? Yeah. And part of the reason um, we have a hard time seeing it is but I don't, I've never seen my brain. But I've sure. seen my arm. I've even taken, a, I've seen an x-ray of my bone, so I know this bone exists. Mm -hmm. But the brain is such a, a, it's such an obscure thing for us to think about it because sure. I've never seen mine. Right, well, yeah. Well, really, really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, we are taking questions tonight. Yes, and we're taking please. them live. Uh, and we're going to be doing, you can submit your questions anonymously. We're doing it on Slido. That's S-L-I-D-O dot com. Uh, uh, you can go there with the event code 94455. Uh, you just and then that is the event for tonight for Theology on Tap. You can leave your questions there, and we will address them. You can also vote on the questions there. Yeah. Uh, so if there, you see another question that you like, go ahead, like that. It'll uh, each vo vote moves it towards the top. And are we going to have it where they can also do it on Facebook Live if they feel comfortable being? Yep, yeah. Okay, it, so you yeah, can do yeah. so, both and. Yep, so I'm watching on Facebook Live. I'm also watching on Slido right now. But if you want to do anonymously, Slido is going to be the way to go. Yeah. So um, you share a little bit about what your thesis was for sure. your PhD. <laughs> no, not, not a that PhD. That was just like my bachelor's science. Oh, that was your bachelor's. Was, okay, yeah, sorry, I apologize. It was just whatever, biology okay. degree. Um, so, yeah, so I think the, the phrase of it's all in your head is particularly interesting because in medicine, we really do think of neuroscience, which interacts with psychology, mental health, behavioral health, all the different terms. That is in my opinion, and a lot of people would share that, is like the last, the most undiscovered, the least understood of yeah. all of the sciences. Like, we can really get to the minutia of the kidney and the minutia of some, of some of the functioning of the organs, but the brain, because we can't just take biopsies of, of it and not change your life, uh, you, mean, you might be able to do that for me. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reliability, so I wouldn't sign up for that stuff. <laughs> I am pretty sure that um, with the amount of concussions I had as a kid, I probably have a different personality. So, so um, But yeah, so the interesting thing about the brain is because we can't do that, we have to study it differently. Yeah. Um, and so the, our ability to make such factual statements about it is based upon a lot of observation as opposed to like, well, let's drill down. Yeah. But differently, so talking about in college, I worked in a neuroscience lab, and literally we had rats that had depression, and I'm not gonna go into how you make a rat depressed, but it has to deal with whether or not they can smell, like, interestingly. <laughs> so, smell and taste are apparently <laughs> critical to rats' well-being. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So, so we took rats that were depressed, we took rats that were not depressed, and then we took those two groups of rats, and they would either exercise, not exercise, be fed a healthful diet, or an unhealthy diet. And then we 
took their brains out, did brain surgery on rats, and then looked at what was different about their brains. So literally, animals that had depression had totally different chemicals, different mm -hmm. signals that you could pick up yeah. on after you sliced their brains and diced them. I mean, so so it's real stuff, like so the, the different areas. So let's talk about that. Um, Biblically, I, I said that there is some mention, I think, of possibly mental health. It's impossible to know this for sure because in the ancient world, they didn't have an understanding of the brain the way we do now. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result of that, we can only speculate. But here are some examples of, I, I think you could say, dealt with some mental health issues. There were some that it very well could have been demonic, and I, we're probably going to get into that question, and actually we should get into that. So for instance, King Saul. Um, we see King Saul at the beginning stages of his reign is doing okay, he seems great, but then David comes in and we see jealousy come in, which that actually could be a mental health issue right mm -hmm. there because he was overly jealous to the point where it haunted him. And there's this interesting verse where it says that the Lord sent an evil spirit to haunt Saul, to torment Saul, and now we, that gets into the spiritual dynamic. Mm -hmm. But we see clear that Saul probably had some sort of mood disorder, like one minute he's Hey, I love you, David. Next minute, he's chucking spears at the dude, right? <laughs> um, King David. Or is that more indicative of him? That might yeah. be more, yeah. <laughs> uh, King David uh, showed some signs of depression. If you read the Psalms, the Psalms are layered mm -hmm. with what they call lament. lament and, yeah. and they are, God, where are you? I feel empty. I feel alone. I feel abandoned. I mean, these are language. These are words used by people who are struggling with depression and anxiety. Um, Job for sure had situational depression. I mean, you lose your entire family, all your money, all your land, and all your help, you're probably going to be depressed and have some anxiety. Uh, Elijah, at one point, does this amazing work on Mount Carmel where he defeats the prophets of Baal. And then the very next scene is him hiding from his enemies and crying out, God, just kill me. Just take me now. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, there's some evidence that Ezekiel might have had schizophrenia because when you read Ezekiel's life, it sure seems to be symptomatic of people with schizophrenia, and yet he was a prophet of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And where does maybe God uses the mental illness as a means to become the vehicle to speak God's word? Jeremiah, Jonah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a new show on. Uh, it's called The Chosen, and it's available online to watch. And apparently, the character who plays Matthew, they're portraying Matthew as someone with autism spectrum disorder, which is a neurological. Mm -hmm. They call it neuroatypical. <laughs> um, and so there's clearly, we see evidence, mm -hmm. evidence. It never says he had depression because that language didn't exist. Sure. And so when we talk about this from a physician standpoint, help, maybe help share a little bit about where does your faith play into the role of being a doctor sure. and recognizing the difference between maybe this is something that's neurological, chemical, mm -hmm. or maybe, it's a, maybe there is something demonic or there's other stuff going on. I'd, you, I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, um, yeah, so I think explaining um, mental illness to persons who come to me, whether it's in the office or outside of the office, like I think of, um, you said circumstantial. So like people will say, oh, I'm depressed. And people will commonly say, oh, that's crazy. Well, guess what? I have patients who are bipolar who are further along in their illness that now are like, now when people say, oh, that's crazy, they realize they're not, they don't know that they're bipolar. They don't know the person they're talking to has bipolar and it's oh. not like a secret, it's in the closet. You know, and so there's, there's different, mental illness is complicated because people sometimes have a lot of insight into it and people sometimes don't have a lot of insight yeah. into what they're going through. And it changes throughout their lifespan. And some mental illness is when you have a strong family history of mental illness, we know that those people in that family are more likely to have yeah. more mental, uh, uh, bear a heavier burden of mental illness as opposed to those do not, who do not have that in their family. So I think of that as the circumstantial maybe can affect both or afflict both, but someone who has no history at all in their family of having a sort of mental illness and then goes through a really rough time, they might end up having what we would consider major depression based upon those criteria but then may be more likely to recover fully and it never happened again because it was yeah. a circumstantial thing. Whereas someone who has a lot of depression or anxiety or other mental illnesses, disorders in their family, it may become more of a disorder for them and then is yeah. then manifested throughout their life. So I guess well, as, a, as a physician and a Christ Christian doctor, I see people on a lot of different phases of life and that's really an honor because I um, feel like 
I get to know them from, from throughout their life and then what they're going through at that time and also their family structure. And that plays into what do they think of their condition and where does their health start? Mm. For some people, like if they're not right mentally, they, you know, they're never going to be right physically. They're never going to make positive eating choices. They're never yeah. going to have healthy relationships. For other people, like if they're not plugged into to their community, to their faith community, their Christian community, like they are never going to get right. Like they're yeah. not. And some people, so it's like a spiritual issue. And some people who have mental issues don't recognize it that they're just not right with God. Or there's these shame and guilt are not talked about in our culture. Yeah. Um, in general, and though I mean, who who just like just airs their guilt and airs their shame? Like that just doesn't happen. Here's my worst moments, <laughs> right. everybody. Yeah, let me tell shame, you the worst, shame, worst shame, moments, shame. and then you just tell me. Here we are. Well, and and so let's let's so, so real quickly on that because you just you said something I think is important. Is so Jesus, you know, one of the first when he's asked if what are the two greatest commands, he said, "Love Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, mm -hmm. and strength," and some say body as mm -hmm. as opposed to strength, right? And Clearly, we are not just singular beings. We have a heart. We have to deal with the emotional side, the mental side, the spiritual, the physical side. And as a doctor, you probably see those more come into play because there are some people who probably just think it's all physical. All I need to do is just deal with the physical, and they ignore the spiritual or the right. mental. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about that? Because you had alluded to it that they need more than just to work out. Like, working out is great. Right. But there's, you're, you're a holistic person. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so I think... In general, we all like quick solutions and easy solutions, and we like like a very a path, you know, as long as that path is easy enough to make the choices to follow. But I think with a lot of illnesses, mental and otherwise, like the solution isn't that easy. Yeah. But we also sometimes fall, you know, make the error of, well, I'm just going to do these 10 things, and by doing trying to do 10 things, we're paralyzed and make no progress. So sometimes you do need someone to say, here's the first couple of steps. But in order for me as a physician to tell anywhere, anyone, well, I think this is a good place for you to start. I really have to understand them yeah. before I can just sort of guess. Otherwise, I'm just throwing darts and hoping that I'm throwing the dart at the right board so the right solution sticks. I think, yeah. I think that um, like when we were talking about the things that Christians say when they're presented with that, like you're talking about something that's, completely overwhelming, something that you yeah. don't know anything about. And so you're like, oh, well, the Bible's good. I'm going to use things from the Bible, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which, yeah. which mm -hmm. is a good intention. Sure. But it's the idea of remembering that for Christians, we regard the Word of God as a sword. And if you don't know the right way to wield a sword, you can end up doing some real, real damage. Yeah. And mm -hmm. We're talking about damage in the spiritual. Like, so you're, you you're, you're presented with mental illness, which is already isolated. That's what we mm -hmm. said earlier. And then, and, then, and then you wound them spiritually with the best intentions. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying don't comfort people. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you, you, gotta, you gotta be careful how you're doing it. You need to know how to, how to use the yeah. sword. Well, and, and, and so Jesus, it says at one point, he looks on the people and he sees them with compassion like a sheep without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And the word in Greek for compassion is splanchnizomai. It's a weird word, but it's literally a guttural ache. Splanchnik, egg. nervous system. Real? Oh, yeah. So it's all connected. It's all That's connected. Hold splanchnik. on. You say your word again. Splanchnizomai. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did no, you just Splanchnizomai. 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 Say yours. Splanchnik. Nervous yeah, it's it's a rooted in Greek. It's a Greek. Thing. It's a Greek, and it's it literally. <laughs> it's all Greek. <laughs> it's it's all Greek to me. It's literally a guttural ache. Is the mm -hmm. idea that when Jesus looked at them, he had a guttural compassion, mm -hmm. and we feel that. And I, I think sometimes it's hard for us to have compassion mm -hmm. on people with mental that are struggling with things yeah. like depression. And I think my approach when I get into these conversations, and they tend to be more one on one. Yeah. You know, like in the office for sure, but even like in my public life or in in church when people come and talk to me and they want to talk about stuff. Um, I think I, a, a lot of times what I would love to see people do more of, and this is what I do because I've been doing it long enough in a clinical practice, is when someone brings something that's kind of heavy or uncomfortable to you, you're, what you want to try to do is lean in. Just lean in. Yeah. Because like body language is so huge. And a lot of times when people come and start sharing stuff with me, I don't know them well enough to know how to help them. I know that they may be thinking that I 
would prescribe them a medicine because uh, clearly that's what I can do. I can help them in a lot of other ways too though. And sometimes like I don't want them just to, I want them to start a medicine if that's what I think will also help them because it changes brain chemistry and those signals are yeah. different for someone who is feeling emotionally one way versus another way or has, has a, a clinically diagnosed issue. Um, but I also, I don't want to just give them something and ta-ta for now. You yeah. know, maybe I'll mm -hmm. see you, please come back in six weeks or what if I forgot to forget to schedule that? Or what if you're more depressed in six weeks and you don't come back because you're feeling pretty suicidal by then? Yeah. Like, it, if, and and if the anything, last time I went, it didn't help. It made it worse. Yeah. So why would I yeah. go again? If anything, just be present to it, even though it's uncomfortable. Because sometimes if you just start saying these niceties and these pat answers, you're wielding the sword wrong. Yeah. Or you're saying it's just in your head, and you don't mean it's just in your head. It kind of, there's things that are in your head, but those are things that we can change and need to work yeah. towards. And, and so from a, uh, one of the questions that I've been asked in the past, and it may come up, is can Christians take medicine? Should Christians take medicine? Mm -hmm. Or should we just pray? Or should it be holistic? There are sects of Christianity that yes. are that reject it outright, yep. that it's of the world. And there are mm -hmm. cults that would say they're part of the Christian branch that completely reject it. That's mm -hmm. more what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's and more what I'm Well, because there are some Christians, some yep. uh, Seventh-day Adventist, for mm -hmm. instance, Seventh-day Adventist, they hold yeah. to a more yeah. strict, strict mm -hmm. view on medicine, of, uh, of food health, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, but there are other ones that are very isolating. Jehovah Witnesses don't do blood transfusions mm -hmm. and so, or Christian scientists that people, it sounds Christian right. until you start realizing that we're talking sometimes on different things. And yeah. that's a different conversation about the difference in religions. But from a biblical perspective, and this is, I can't talk about this because I, <laughs> I, would, I would say I'm a theologian, right? Um, medicine, yes, we don't necessarily see medicine the way we see it here, but we see at one point, Timothy has a stomach issue. And Paul's, his encouragement to him is drink wine, which at that time was known as a medicinal healing for the stomach. And amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> this is called Theology on Tap. By the way, this is not beer because we're in the dock. Yeah. But this is, this is iced tea. I've got Diet Snapple. Diet Snapple. It's high raspberry. Quality. High quality. High quality, high quality H2O. H2O. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bobby Bushy. <laughs> The price is wrong, Bob. <laughs> um, and so when we, when we look at the issue of medicine, um, I know Christians who are so ashamed of taking medicine because they think it's a reflection of their faith. If, well, I, obviously something's wrong with me. If I just had more faith, I'd be fine. And where they get, I don't know where they get it from biblically because it's not biblical. Right. Yeah, and if I could just like... And, and I say this to people, if I could just like take that, I'm just, I'm just going to take that. You do not think that anymore. Yeah. Because, I mean, God also gave us our minds. He gave us our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our guts. He gave us all the parts. Yeah. And we're all gifted differently and we all heal. And our solution is different and unique. And because we know that that's, your brain is different. Like the, we, the medicines that I use, I specifically think about, okay, what am I doing with your norepinephrine, your dopamine? Like, what am I doing with your serotonin? Like, as I Can we use words that make her feel? Let's talk about eschatology. Eschatology and yeah. ecclesiology. And yeah. let's talk about epistemology. Yeah, <laughs> okay. But those are the things that we're changing that help people, you yeah. know? And so when I, um, if I have someone in my office, and I talk a lot about what are your hesitations for seeking help? Is it because your family would never do this? Is it because Christians should never do this? Is yeah. it because it's expensive? Is it because it's mm. too frequently? Is it because you, your husband doesn't want you to come? You know, why, don't you, why do you think you shouldn't be here? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Because if I can't help get past that, like you may not have the benefit, your life won't be changed in ways that it could by seeking help. Yeah. And I want to help. Well, and imagine somebody breaks their arm and they're afraid to go to the doctor and their arm heals, but now it's all bent out of shape. Right. Because yeah. they, and of course we'd be like, why didn't you go to the doctor? Well, I was embarrassed. Why? And mental health has such a stigma. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I think it's such a good thing that culturally there's now more sensitivity to mental health issues. Cause I remember growing up, we would use words like crazy regularly mm -hmm. and, and we would see people and, and, it was not uncommon to make fun of people that seem to have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And now there's a lot more awareness of it. And I think that's a good thing in our culture. Mm. But the church sometimes still lags behind in that, like we often do. And a lot of it comes down to is a misunderstanding of spirituality, of what it actually means to trust God. And, and Jesus himself says, listen, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. So he even uses a, a literal example, but he's talking about spiritual health, but he's acknowledging that Doctors existed back then, and they, they were an important part of the culture. And I think that's important to, like, 
you know, some people will lump everything as behavioral health, and that's like all your coping mechanisms. Yeah. If you cope and Jesus is your crutch, if you cope and alcohol is your crutch, but behavioral health is all this thing. Like, as a Christian doctor, like, I really, truly, like, mental health is different than spiritual health. They yeah. interact a ton, and they can help, like, your emotional and mental health can help your spiritual journey. Yeah. Your spiritual health certainly influences your mental journey, but they yeah. are still different. Well, and, and being in ministry, being as a pastor, I've been, I've been in ministry for 20 years now, and we hear almost, it's sadly, pretty regularly, at least once a year of a pastor who commits suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, Rick Warren, Rick and Kay Warren's son committed suicide uh, just a few years ago. I've had several friends that are pastors whose children have committed suicide. And what happens in the church, because there's that stigma, that fear of being able to talk about it, they hide and they don't get the help they want because they're ashamed or embarrassed. And already mental health, that's the tendency for a lot of depression is to already hide. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the signs of depression is that you're withdrawing, right? Mm -hmm. But now when you add shame to that yeah. or a community that doesn't know how to come alongside and love. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I do want to get into a little bit on the suicide issue. And I just want to mm -hmm. say right now that if you have, if you have know somebody who's committed suicide um, or you have a loved one who has, first of all, I'm so sorry. I really am. Um, this is a real issue. Mm -hmm. LGBTQ issues, LGBTQ youth are, are the most highly susceptible mm -hmm. right now. They're, they're seeing a spike in a lot of that. Um, but one of the misunderstandings comes from this belief that if you commit suicide, you're going to hell because it's a mortal sin, which is as a Catholic belief. And, and I want to be clear, as, an, as a Protestant, evangelical Protestant Christian, I don't see suicide as the ultimate unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, the individuals, I've had several friends that have committed suicide, and for them, they had gotten to such a dark place. And I remember thinking when I was younger, well, people who commit suicide are just selfish. But in reality, often they, they are so locked in depression that they actually think they're helping the world. They think they're, that's the solution for their family, not yeah. for them. They, they, a lot of times they think, like, if I do this, then they won't have to... X, Y, and Z, deal with me, yeah. the money, the drama, the, the whatever it is. But they really think like that's a ticket out. Yes, maybe for them, but a lot of times they're, they're, they're feeling like they're dying is the solution for their loved ones. Yeah, it's, it's um, when we look at that, again, we never want to encourage suicide, right? I, I always want to discourage it. And if you're having depressive thoughts, you need Gosh. to get help. But we need to also get this idea of that if somebody commits suicide, that they're in hell. Like, I just, I don't see that biblically. And I can, I can tell you where the theology comes from. It's that they've not put their trust in Jesus. But mental health, literally when somebody is depressed, when they're dealing with bipolar mm -hmm. disorder, when they've hit that low mania side, yeah. or when you're dealing with anxiety to where they're overwhelmed, they cannot see a way out. Yeah. And this is why the church community is so helpful and also why we need, we need medicine. Because some of that is they need somebody who can steer them through the dark. Because I've had periods of depression, but I don't suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. But I know in those low times, man, there were moments I can honestly say in my own life where I was mm -hmm. like, God, if there was a way out of this, it would be easy. Mm -hmm. And it gave me yeah. a little bit of compassion yeah. because there are individuals who go years with that. Yeah. And I think as the church, we need to find a way to obviously discourage that they need, they need to know they're loved. But how do we come alongside of family members? Yeah. yeah, and I think you shared a lot of statistics at the beginning, and I think this is from some lecture buried in my head, but um, once someone told me that one in six people are affected by suicide, and I yeah. think that means you either know someone or know someone who knows someone, like, but it, but it really influences your life. Yeah. Um, and that's another one of those isolating things. My, I had a cousin who committed suicide several years ago. I still remember the day. I remember the call from my uncle, and my uncle was you know, I mean, just reaching out in anguish and talking to me early morning. And my first thing to him was, you need to tell everyone, like tell. And, and I think I said, tell everyone. Because I was like, oh, like I have parents in my practice who their children have committed suicide. And some of them walk around with this for the rest yeah. of their life, this weight in a, in a Oh, it's just so, it, it's, it's terrible, you know? Yeah. And some of them have had that experience, have had that as part of their story. Their children have had, their child has committed suicide. 
and yet they somehow recover. Like it's, it, you can't take away the trauma of all of our lives. Like yeah. this is a fallen world. You know, we all have trauma. We all have things that happen to us that are less than lovely and some of them outright horrific, yeah. horrific. But I said, you know, share with people who you trust because I was like, you're in a small community. Like I know all the people we work with, they're gonna, we're gonna reach up and we're gonna yeah. envelop you with love and support. And yeah. you know, and because, because it is such a, it, it, we consider suicide one of the diseases of despair. That's how doctors yeah. talk about it. it is and, and I think we need, even as the church, I think we have to reframe that conversation because the ripple effect on the family, some families are embarrassed by it. Yeah. And they're afraid to talk about it or they're afraid of the stigma. And, and this is why that word compassion is so important. Mm -hmm. That's my hope for tonight is really is that we'll bring some awareness. And, and I don't know if we have any questions yet. Um, yeah, we do. Um, so then uh, before I get into it, we are taking questions um, and you can leave them anonymously. Uh, we're doing that through Slido. That's S-L-I-D-O dot com. Uh, you go there, type in event code 94455. Uh, and you can leave your questions there anonymously. You can also like questions. So if you see one that you want, uh, you want to vote on, go ahead, give it a like, and it moves towards the top. Uh, the first one that we have is: uh, Does taking medicine mean you're giving in to temptations, like giving in to those bad ideas? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, and I'm gonna, I want to be careful not to speak out of turn. I think we are. My opinion is, I think we're an overmedicated society. Um, especially in the 90s. I still remember in the 90s, it seemed like they were constantly pushing drug commercials. Yeah. And to a, of, the best way to avoid sure. pain was just take medicine, right? The opiate crisis. The opiate, oh. yes, the opiate <laughs> crisis. That's a real, that's why that came about, right? My mom right. didn't want me to get tested for uh, ADD because she said, it, she said it was my artful, delightful design. And so she didn't want to medicate that. And, and, and so and I, Which means she knew that I had it. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Why yeah. go to a doctor? Yeah, I know it's, my son. And so, <laughs> save a couple bucks. So I think there's a, there's a couple ways that I would approach that question from a theological perspective. Mm -hmm. um, scripture can be helpful when you're dealing with stuff. Absolutely. But let's not use, there's a term called spiritual bypass, which is when we use the Bible as an excuse to avoid hard work. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. Right? But I also think there's a medical bypass where it's just, just medicate so I feel better so yeah. I don't have to deal with it. And what Christ has called us to Part of the dying to the self is being willing to deal with self-awareness and deal with trauma. Now, mm -hmm. I, I'll, just, I'll just be honest here. If you're watching, and, and this is my own part of my journey, I did EMDR therapy mm -hmm. um, because of trauma in my own life. And I don't need to get into that tonight. Uh, but this last year, back in October, I did three months of EMDR where it was working through uh, just the psychological impact of some things that happened in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And... It was one of the most painful and difficult things I've ever done. But coming on the other side, there was no medicine involved. It was therapy. And I think that's the other side is sometimes mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that I've heard, and, and maybe you can speak to this better than I can, is that in order for true healing to help to work with a person, the best combination is if they need medication, they should also do therapy at the same time. Yeah. And, and not, all, not all people who do therapy needs medicines. But if you're doing medicine, you should be doing therapy mm -hmm. because if you're not careful, you are falling into that where you're just taking the drug to, to escape possibly. Mm -hmm. Now, not always. There yeah. are some mental health in, issues that therapy is not going to resolve the issue, but it might give you coping yeah. skills. Well, I think there's such a spectrum. So um, the question, again, I think was whether that's just running from... Does, uh, does taking medicine mean you're giving into temptations, okay. like giving into those bad ideas? Yeah. yeah. So I think that when it comes to taking medicines. So there's, there's spectrums of ev every mental disorder we have in the DSM-5, which is, again, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So for major depression, because that's just an easy one to talk about, for major depression, the criteria are two weeks of five out of the nine symptoms. So there's also, you know, we all have maybe like a funk, like where we have three or four days. I'm feeling like, blue. Yeah, like I'm blue, I'm down. Like that doesn't always meet the criteria or truly for clinical depression. If you have clinical depression, then we do have great studies and information to show that medicines help because yeah. your brain chemistry is different when you're clinically depressed. So kid, and maybe uh, this is my understanding, and if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, tell me. My understanding is that the brain, because it's, it's this really complex thing, when, you, when you're in situations, chemicals start getting released or not released in order right. to protect itself. 
-hmm. And in time, mm -hmm. the brain adapts, mm -hmm. yes. which that then leads can actually lead to depression because you've been so stuck in that for so long. And the medicine actually kind of kickstarts the brain yeah. by putting those and chemicals you can back think in. Think of it as like chronic stress. Like think of something that's chronically beat up. Think of a hockey stick that you constantly use. Dr. Hall will appreciate that. There you yeah, go. That, right? there you go. What's something that's beat? <laughs> 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 All right. So, so I mean, think of something that's beat up and used. Like it gets battered, you know? And so when you're living in with a lot of chronic stressors, whatever you perceive that to be or whatever those are in your life, um, if you're overwhelmed by those and you don't have that sense of control, even if you're not someone who is wired for depression because it's all over your family, even if it is just a circumstance or just a season or just yeah. a phase, like, you know, we try to discount it some of the times, but if, it, if you've slipped into this two weeks or more of this deep dark place like your brain chemistry has changed and yeah. that's why those medicines make a difference which by the way they didn't know that in the bible no they didn't know sure. about they didn't know about neurology and yeah. they didn't know about the chemicals yeah. being really serotonin and, and epinephrine and all exactly. that stuff yeah and then to speak to some of that is why does why does counseling help so there's different varieties of counseling like a lot of people who struggle with things start discounting the positives oh i got a great review at work oh but they just tell everyone they're good you know um oh i can tell you five good things but you know i would really prefer you to tie your shoes differently oh i can't believe i tied my shoes wrong like that's yeah. all i think you know so so we have these cognitive we th these cognitive distortions which is like you think wrong yep. and to replace that those negative thoughts with the better thoughts that's one type of therapy that is mm. common and and i think you can make a biblical argument that part of the renewing of the mind, and this is where I think sometimes scripture is misused, is we'll say, when you become a believer, you have a new mind in Christ. Well, that's great, but you know, I still got this wart on my arm, and that didn't disappear. Right. And so what is the renewing of the mind that Paul is talking about? And it's a spiritual renewal. It's understanding that I am redeemed in Christ. It means mm -hmm. that I no longer am controlled by the values of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's the hope talked about in yes. Hebrews. Well, in yeah. Romans chapter 12, So, and this is such a, I think this is so critical for people to understand. Um, when we read Romans chapter 12, people will often quote this verse because it talks about the renewing of the mind. Mm -hmm. And in it, they're missing the part. There it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is not a verse saying that if you become a Christian or if you love Jesus enough, that you won't suffer from depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And this is how I know that. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is why it's so important to read scripture in context. And then Paul goes into a whole list of how we are to act as Christians. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to stop being judgmental. We're supposed to have sober judgment and awareness about ourselves. We're supposed to put others above ourselves. To have the mind of Christ doesn't mean that I don't suffer from depression. It means I think like Jesus does about other people. Mm -hmm. But if I just read that verse, and this is one of the verses that was used towards my wife and I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible says if you, were, if you had laid your life down on the altar of Jesus, you'd have a renewed Thanks. mind. It'd be fixed. Yep. And all that did, were they loving? They actually were living out the verse because they weren't being loving or compassionate. They, <laughs> they, weren't, they were actually causing more harm. Right? Swing and a miss. And, mm -hmm. Swing and a miss. And this Swing is and why I think from, from, a Christian, <laughs> <laughs> from a Christian perspective, we actually can bring a different hope. Because if, if your hope is only in medicine and science, we are spiritual people. Even if you're not a Christian, you're still a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. And I think the gospel offers a hope in there, but that doesn't mean we neglect the physical side. I mean, Paul talks about that physical training is of some use. Mm -hmm. Well, physical training is also mental training. Mm -hmm. And therapy can be a very helpful thing. But when you couple therapy with the gospel, oh, my gosh, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there, it's a hope. There's it a is. Hope there. a hope. Yep. Um, the next question we have is, uh, if, I'm assuming this is for you. Uh, okay. If you struggle with depression, do you have a higher chance of suffering from postpartum depression? Yeah. I, I let me uh, you know. Let me tell you what the Bible. <laughs> I'm gonna let as, Jason as, take this. One. As two <laughs> men, he's doing great. As a man, I have lots of opinions no. about postpartum we'll okay. depression. Let's survey the crowd. No, yeah. <laughs> you just need to stop right there. No, that's why I think it's for you. Um, 
But yes, yes you do. And, and um, if you have a history of depression or anxiety or trauma, I mean, some people don't go into their delivery with any trauma and then they have a very traumatic delivery experience. Yeah. And you go into your delivery thinking like, oh, at the end of this, there's this lovely baby and things are gonna go great. And then it's very traumatic because yeah. you think it's gonna go well and it's an emergency C-section with the baby's heart rate and you think your baby might die. I mean, it's a very, that well, can be very As traumatic. someone who witnessed a childbirth, childbirth in general is traumatic. Regardless. <laughs> the C-section. There is that is Genesis chapter three. Like there is holy cow. It is it is. There is crying and yeah. sweating and all kinds yeah. of other things. Um, so when we talk about angst, when we talk about um, depression, anxiety, that kind of stuff, and, and and particularly with women, what would be an encouragement for you as a doctor for somebody who is struggling through that? Especially if this is a Christian asking, what would your encouragement to them be? Yeah, I mean, I think. Several things. I mean, I think, like I mentioned earlier, like a multifaceted solution. Because when you're a new mom or a second or third new mom, like you just lose so much control. And I yeah. think when all of a sudden you feel out of control. Now, having this conversation amidst a pandemic is fantastic because I think we all have this illusion that we're in way more control than we are. Yeah. And then to have that shaken for so many people because all of a sudden we are way less in control or at least realizing like, Huh. Like, I don't know, having thoughts that I never certainly thought that I would have or yeah. the experiences. That's and, real. You know, and so I think um, my encouragement for another Christian mother going through something like that is, you know, you really need to get plugged into your community of Christian supportive people yeah. as well as plugged into your doctor, <clears throat> as well as think of as if it's realistic to get plugged into your counselor. Like, reach out. And, and then the hard part is you're, deal you're taking care of a new baby, and I don't know your life situation, and your yeah. job and your husband's job and your social support, but you just have to find your tribe and then find your team of how, how you're gonna navigate that, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a book that came out in 2015 called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's by, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher the name, I'm sure, Bessel van der Kolk. Kolk. Yes, okay. But yeah. the idea behind the book is, and I've, I've listened to a few podcasts and I'd listened to an interview with the person who wrote it, is that the body is so uniquely wired, and I think this actually is a testimony to God and how we're created. I mean, mm -hmm. our bodies are so intricate, uh, the way the brain works, everything else. But that when trauma happens, it actually changes us on a cellular level. Mm -hmm. And that that actually can be passed down to your children. Mm -hmm. And so there's evidence, according to this, this, this mm -hmm. uh, researcher, is that when trauma happens, you carry that trauma, not just in your head, it affects you physically. It, yeah. it affects you at a cellular level. Yeah. And then that actually can be passed down. So there, what that means is, is that if you don't deal with your trauma, when you have children, that actually, that you, you can't affect change in a good way and if whether, you get the help you need. that's like behavioral, because yeah. hurting people hurt people. Yep. The whole like, you know, when you've been hurt and carry that trauma, if you haven't processed it to gain the insight and grow from it, a lot of times that plays out in your relationships. And unfortunately, it plays out even more so in those closest relationships. Yeah. You know, so so dealing with those things with a safe, tight knit, the safe people like you don't just air this out everywhere, but find your people who are your anchors and yeah. then use them. I mean, yeah. they people want to help each other. We want to help, you know. Yeah, uh, that's good. I like that. The next one, uh, I've been told to have more faith when I felt depressed. What are your thoughts on that? We kind of talked about that. Yeah, I guess bit. I would reiterate. Um, I was just talking with somebody else right now who's suffering from cancer. And we were having a conversation about end of life stuff and mm -hmm. just the reality that God may not heal, right? And one of the disservices that, that happens in the church is we think that the goal is faith and not the object of our faith. Faith is not the goal. The goal is not to have more faith. The goal is to have more faith in Jesus. Yeah, it's not the goal. It's the tool. That's the tool. Mm -hmm. and, and so even when somebody says you need to have more faith, what am I having faith in? And, and then if I have a relationship with Jesus, and this is where I think it's so important that that phrase, we, we kind of either need to get it out of our vocabulary or at least give it better context. Right. Um, the goal is to have relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if I make the goal faith, well, Scripture is pretty clear that faith is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. So therefore, my faith isn't even something I conjure up, the faith of a mustard seed, right? It, it's, it's not the amount of faith that I have that matters. It's the size of my God that matters. Mm -hmm. And if I have faith in God, then I trust and, and I think this is, there's another question in this, and that is, why would a loving God 
allow mental illness? Did God create people with one mental of the, illness? One of the questions that we have further down, um, uh, where do mental health issues come from theologically? And I think you're about to address yep, that. Yep, I am. And last, last month we talked about theodicy, where is God in suffering? That's what theodicy is, is explaining how do we justify God in the midst of suffering in the world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a very Christian pat answer and then recognize that we don't have enough time to really do it justice. We live in a broken world. And when Adam and Eve sinned, when sin entered into the world, everything fell with it, including our genes. And I think it's, um, we want to be careful not to define people by mental illness or by uh, mental diagnosis, so whether it be autism or any of those things. God can use them. I'm going to be careful. I want to be careful not to say God doesn't cause them. Um, I do believe God can use them, but I do believe that our genes are fallen. Mm -hmm. And why is it, and this is the interesting part, we're, we're so quick to blame God when things don't go our way, but then sometimes the stuff that we're dealing with is consequences of our own choices or the choices of others. Yeah. And, and abuse is a big one. Yeah. So, and the choices are hard because sometimes you develop thought patterns that in the beginning they're a choice, but no one else knew what was happening in the six yes. inches between your ears. So while you were making choices about how you're thinking about me, how you perceive me, how, you know, this, that, and the other, no one, I wasn't speaking that out loud. So no one knew that 10 years ago, this person started lying to themselves in their head. Patterns of thought. Yes. Yes. And then, and then at some point that person will say, well, this isn't a choice. It's how I am. Okay. So neuroplasticity, and yeah. I've, I've done some research on this, so I'm, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but what happens is your brain is like water, the, mm -hmm. the neurons that's going to take the least path of resistance. And mm -hmm. so when you develop those thoughts, you're, especially when you think of for a long time, the brain goes, oh, that's the easiest path of resistance, which is why when you suffer from depression, anxiety, and if I'm wrong, tell me, say, yeah. Jason, you're totally off. No, that's great. But mm -hmm. my understanding is, is that your brain begins to wire and say, that's the easiest route, which yeah. is why when you're depressed and anxious, all those things, your brain has developed that pathway. Now, the unique thing is we can retrain our brains mm -hmm. through therapy, cognitive therapy, EMDR, um, dialectical therapy, all those different ones to retrain the process. The bigger question, and, and I, I don't know what the answer to this one is, when medicine comes in, when it's a, when it's a chemical issue, where does that play into those pathways? Well, so even to think about, I explain um, many people who have, struggle with anxiety end up at some point having panic attacks. Yeah. Um, and those are terrifying. I mean. I had one once. Terrifying. It was, I thought I was having a heart attack. Yes. <laughs> I was convinced I was dying. All the time. Yep. Yeah. And people will frequently present to the emergency room and they have that, like, that sense of doom. I can't breathe. My, I'm on fire. Like, you know, it feels like a heart attack. I, so I was, real quickly, I, was, I, had, I had worked myself to the point where I was working 70 hours a week. I was just on a mission trip. I think I was 29 at the time, 20, 29, 30. <laughs> I had done back-to-back -back mission trip with youth. I was sleeping at the church because we had 350 junior hires. Oh and the last night of the event, and we were about ready to go on another three days, and 11.30 at night, I'm talking with our oh guest speaker, and all of a sudden, I felt this in my chest, and I couldn't catch my breath. And he looks at me, he goes, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm really tired, and I can't catch my breath. So I lay down, and the, the ceiling starts doing this. So I do, the, I do the wisest thing possible. I go, WebMD, signs of a <laughs> no. heart attack. <laughs> And of the, like, six signs, no. I had five. Oh, no. And so I call Lisa. Lisa's asleep at home. Oh, no. And I call her, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to call an ambulance because we've got 350 junior hires at the church, right? And so I call, I call my, one of my interns, and I go, hey, I need you to take me to the emergency room. I think I might be having a heart attack. And I call Lisa, and she's dead asleep because it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Hey, babe, I don't want you to worry. I'm going to the emergency room. I might be having a heart attack. And she goes, okay, I'll see you in the morning. And she hangs up the phone. <laughs> And my intern is driving me to the emergency room, and I can't catch my breath, mm -hmm. and I am convinced I'm going to die. Like I, and I don't know, I don't know my biological father, so I'm thinking I'm oh. having a heart attack. So I go in to meet the ER doctor, and there's something about late night ER doctors. His bedside manner was horrible, and this is literally comes up. He goes, "Your heart's fine. It's just a panic attack. You just stop just, worrying about yeah, it." Just and I'm like, "What?" But I had all this shame because yeah. here I'm a pastor, I'm a youth pastor. 
I shouldn't be having a You're panic. You're like, how did I pull it together? I like, shouldn't have a panic attack. Yeah. And so what happened there is like, just like if, if, if you just do bicep curls all day long, guess what? Like you have one big bicep, okay? Yeah. Like just like when you worry about one thing all day long and then that gets elevated and you have a panic attack, <clears throat> that's like a neural circuit firing that is like a hot poker. So is that what's know? causing that? Is it a feedback loop? Yes. And so okay. when that happens, the reason that we specifically use some controlled substances to medicate people out of panic attacks is because we want to stop that. Like we don't want it mm. to get stronger. Yeah. Like the panic needs to stop so that we can start using some other medicines to help rewire some of those signals so that you don't have that loop getting stronger. But guess what? What else what else helps stop that? Deep breathing, meditation. There's yeah. other things that you oh. do behave grounding behaviorally. Tons like, what can tons I see? of what research. Can I taste? What do I smell? Like yeah. there's there's techniques that we teach in counseling that get you help get you off that panic loop, not meaning that that's all you ever use. Sometimes you use both the medicine yeah. and that, but that's like doing a bicep curl if that's all you're, if you're living on panic loop, because then the rest of the day, even when you come off of that, a lot of times people are like, well, I start the day here, I have a panic attack, I'm here. Even when I come off my panic attack all day, I'm here. I'm not back down to normal. Christian spirituality has been talking about the benefits of meditation, as do other religions. Oh, and just now, science tremendous. is catching up that meditation tremendous. does tremendous work for us. The mm -hmm. difference between Christian meditation and others is we meditate on God's word mm -hmm. and we chew on it right and mm -hmm. and it's um, that deep breathing that groundingness mm -hmm. like being grounded and being appreciative uh, um, what's the word um, uh, when you're thankful gratitude, gratitude the power of gratitude mm -hmm. in dealing with that and those are the things where you can take a drug, but you have to make a choice to be grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A drug's never going to make you grateful. And the difference, <laughs> so I think it's different, like, it's interesting, like, we have, a, we actually have quite a lot of counselors at Iowa Specialty, but it's interesting because I've had friends and patients who are like, a, a patient who is Christian, who went to a counselor who was not counseling her as a Christian, and said, take your issue and take it and roll it away. Yeah. And she was like, Renee, like, I'm going to take it and lay it at the cross. Like, that's what works for me, yeah. is to make that, like, in my Christian worldview, like, I'm not just going to roll it into the black abyss. Yeah. Like, that doesn't feel safe. That's Who's our taking hope. care of my issues? That's the Who's gospel. Care? Yeah. You know, where's that going? Like, that's going nowhere. Who's got that now? Yeah. Well, if I lay it at the cross, God's got it. Yeah. You know? Um, I've got let's a, do one more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap well, it up for the Well, we have a couple here that, that I, I, I think should be looked at. Uh, okay. The first one was, I have wondered if suicidal thoughts are God calling you to him. No. I'm, let me just, I'm going to emphatically say no, and here's why. God is a God of life, not of death. God hates death. He wanted you to have life and have it to the fullest. That's right. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to its fullest. And the enemy, and this is the spiritual warfare side of things, Satan wants to bring death. So if you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, know that is not God beckoning you. That is the enemy lying to you, or it's your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. There might be other, other medical conditions, yes. but there is a spiritual element to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes back to some of the, the horrible pseudo theology that exists in the church is when people, you lose somebody and they'll say, oh, well, God needed that person up in heaven more than you did down here. That's a horrible God. Mm -hmm. That is not a God I want to worship who is like, you know what I want to do is cause all kinds of suffering because I really need them up close to me. Also, when we die, we don't go to become angels. We don't become angels. No. no. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we, we are body, soul, mind, and spirit. Angels are a separate thing from us. And so what I, when somebody, and I've had that question asked before, because mm -hmm. someone was like, I feel like it's maybe God calling me home. It's an easy way to escape pain. Mm -hmm. um, Hebrews talks about suffering. James talks about suffering. Romans talks about suffering. And when you're dealing with suicidal thoughts, from a Christian perspective, Christian counseling perspective, I think it's important to realize, one, that lie that death is easier is exactly, a, it's, it's a lie. lie. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, is that when you get on the other side of it, and you will, it might take some time, but as Christians, sometimes we struggle with the suffering, or as people, and there is something to be said about learning and finding joy through suffering. Um, today in our devotion, the devotion I did today, I talked about that a lot of reasons why people don't experience joy is they don't have the patience to work through the suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when you meet somebody who, instead of giving in, or I've met individuals who attempted suicide, and when they finally got help, they realized, I felt like it was going to be forever, and it wasn't. Yeah, and to, and to see to see a life brought to the fullest on the other side of suicide, 
So just today, um, Ravi Zacharias passed Died, away. Yeah. Oh, uh, such um, a loss for our community. But. No kidding. Uh, I was like, I've actually kind of just been down all day about mm-hmm. it. But part of his story is that uh, he was, I think, 17 years old, and he was on a bed of suicide. Like, uh, he attempted suicide and failed, and out of that came to know Christ, and then went to do this great kingdom work. Yeah. And the 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 amount of the, the the amount of blessing and joy and fulfillment on yeah. the backside of that. Not that God caused it, but that He turns it he for good. It. Yeah. I had a friend who's I don't have permission to use his name, so I won't use it, but. Um, he slit his arms and wrists dozens of times up in a hotel room, trying to do everything he could to kill himself. And we were fishing one day, and I saw these scars, and I'm like, hey, what's with the scars? And he said, I, had, I, he was, I think he was an alcoholic, drug addict, and his, he was at a hotel, his wife was home. I think, I don't know if they had kids or not. And he goes, and I just, I, I thought it'd be easier to end it. Well, it just so happens when he fell, the hotel clerk heard a thud, and normally wouldn't have given a second thought called the emergency service, called 911. Mm. They came up and saved him, and he should have died. Mm. Now he was, when I knew him, he was leading Celebrate Recovery. Wow. Yeah. And he was talking about that the hope on the other side, but in that moment, he really believed oh. that the best thing he could do for his family, he thought yeah. he was a burden to his wife. And that's where the lie, and, and for God, for I think for what, what you need to hear from the Lord on this, death was a curse. It's never the answer. Mm. Even Jesus needing to die on the cross, that's not what... God wanted for us, it's what we needed to yeah. bring us back into right relationship. Yeah. And so if you're suffering with suicidal thoughts, first of all, please get help. Please. Mm-hmm. Know you're mm-hmm. loved. Talk to a pastor. Talk to your doctor. Talk to somebody mm-hmm. that will do it to encourage you to the right steps. Um, so you, you said there was a couple of yeah, questions. Yeah, so uh, we've got two more. Um, could mental health issues be a punishment for sins? Um, I would say I'm going to get away from the word punishment and say consequence. I think sometimes mental health issues will be a consequence of sins, but they may not always be your sins. Yeah. And this is where trauma comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have somebody who's a victim of child abuse, mm-hmm. that, that child abuser probably had, had other underlying issues, maybe some mental health issues, but guess what? Now you're going to carry that weight. That and, and the movement away from the word punishment is it, it's a misrepresentation of the character of God. That's right. Yeah, he's, he's not vindictive. He's not some bearded Gandalf dude in the sky throwing fire, yeah. fire bolts. No, uh, lightning bolts. Um, <laughs> Too much D&D, bro. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, it's not, that's not the way that it is. Right. But, um, but yes, there, there, is a, there is a consequence to sin, and sometimes that, that can be the way. Well, and I think that if you're we all make choices constantly, every yeah. day, all day. And if you're making choices that aren't to honor and glorify God, and those are choices away from God, that yeah. separates you from God. And the purpose and, of the law was to protect us, not yeah. to harm us. And so, like, for instance, um, if you're drinking all the time and not working out, not taking care of your body, and you get into depression, you can't blame God for that. Like that's, yeah, like, if that's like the root of your depression, you yeah. have to start making different choices. But that's mm-hmm. different than a genetic mm-hmm. component. Yes. And I think that's where we can turn to the Gospels where there's a man who's born blind and people used to believe that if you were born blind, it was a punishment to either you or your parents. Mm-hmm. And they ask him, was this man born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? It, it, like a generational curse. Yeah, yeah. and Jesus like, neither. It was so that the Son of Man might be glorified. And then Jesus heals his blindness. But there is, again, they didn't understand that there is genetic components. Mm-hmm. There's also, um, uh, there's environmental components that can lead to depression. If you're not eating well, this I love that you talked mm-hmm. about that earlier, is how you eat affects, can yeah. affect you mentally. But that's, schizophrenia isn't caused because you ate a cheeseburger. No. I mean, that'd be awesome. Just like, don't eat McDonald's anymore. Schizophrenia gone. Yeah. That's, there's a fracturing in yeah. the mind. And there's, I think we talked a lot tonight about anxiety and depression. Those are things that roll off our tongue easiest because those are the things we that see are the most. more prevalent. Yeah. But like different disorders have different solutions. And some of the disorders like certainly need medication. Schizophrenia you being know? a big one. Yes. Yeah. You know, so there's ones that like you can't, no talk therapy, no behavioral change is probably going to really truly yeah. fix or cure that unless that's God's choice to cure that. And that's, yeah. and schizophrenia is not multiple personality disorder, right. which is what it's I different. was taught when I was younger. Very different things. Different, yeah. And, and here's something interesting. This is why I brought up Ezekiel. Some people will say, well, Ezekiel didn't hear the voice of the Lord if he was schizophrenic. Or God can use anybody any way he wants to. And maybe mm-hmm. he used, if he was schizophrenic, God can use somebody who is depressive, mm-hmm. who's got depression, schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. You are not defined by mental illness. And I think that's important to say. So when somebody says, 
I'm this. No, you're a child of the king. And yes, yes. you have this, but and that you doesn't struggle define with. you. You struggle yes. with. It. Or that thing influences you. So if you're schizophrenic, you're not a schizophrenic. No. You're a person who has this mental and health issue. It's part issue. of you. Yes. It's yeah. part of you. It's part of your journey. It's part of your experience. And that's why I think like living in community is so beneficial. And like a, a loving open community yeah. so that you can share those things to brothers and sisters of Christ and process yeah. them. So this kind of brings us to, this will be the, this is the very last question. Uh, yeah. what are, and I'd actually like to start it. Um, what are some things we can do to support a friend who struggles with mental illness? And um, uh, we've, we've, we kind of talked about some of the things you don't do. Uh, <laughs> they, there are some tropes that you can fall on and, uh, and, some most of the time end up doing more damage than good. Uh, sometimes, truly, the best thing you can do is to just be there. Lean don't in. say anything. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to do anything. It's 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 called just the ministry of presence. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm there. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes that is just the best thing to do is to be there in the room. And if you have somebody who's really struggling and maybe there's fear, mm -hmm. sometimes it's that encouragement to say, you don't have to go alone. Yeah. If you're really afraid, I'll go with you. Mm -hmm. I actually came up with an acronym that it's, it spells out SCUM. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but I, was, I, I didn't even mean to. I was thinking through what are the, what are the, what are the responses that as, as a Christian would be helpful. The first one is offer support. Mm -hmm. And support is not advice. Yeah, that's good. That support is that's not advice. advice. Support is, mm -hmm. hey, I'm here with you. You're not alone. I love you. You're not defined by this. But the last thing you need to do is, you know, just take more kale. What you need is some essential oils. Kale, yeah. You just need some more essential Are you eating quinine or whatever that stuff is? So the first one is support. Offer support. Be there. Kale, no. The second is offer compassion. And compassion is similar to, to support, but compassion is stepping into and recognizing that for them this is very real. And there's nothing worse than having your heartache minimized because somebody yeah. tries to say, well, I've, I've been blue before. Yeah, don't minimize it. Don't yeah. minimize. Offer mm -hmm. compassion. The third is seek understanding. Mm -hmm. And especially the deeper in relationship that you are with somebody, when I know that somebody has mental health issues, I'll do a little research just so I have an idea of what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Because if I, I can't empathize with it because I don't know what that's like. Right. Give them a voice. Like, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is mercy. And that recognize for some of this is a scary thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when you put those things together, the, when you put the scum together, <laughs> I was going to find another yeah. U so I could have mucus, but I decided scum was better. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you notice what I didn't put in there is scripture. I, I, I really, I'm going to encourage that when somebody is doing stuff, don't just start throwing the Bible at them because you don't realize that for them, it's not about how much they're praying. Now, maybe there is a spiritual side of it, but I've seen a lot of harm come when Christians just throw Bible yeah. verses well, at people. Well, I think if you, like the you and your scum, like if you seek for understanding and you have that open conversation and you learn that because they're feeling so depressed, they're having a hard time going to church. They're having a hard yeah. time going to their groups. They're having a hard time, you know, interacting. Like, and that that helps them, that elevates them. And they're basically like, that does, that gives me, that gives some wind, some wind underneath my wings. Like, yeah. yes, I would love if you have something like then, you know, then by all yeah, means, give us but scripture. It's, but it's, a, it's through the There's understanding. There's a time and a place. That's right. If they're asking for it, if mm -hmm. they're saying, hey, do you have any Bible verses that could offer encouragement, which I've had people, mm -hmm. but that's different than just... Just throwing it. Past. Just throwing at it. Well, here's the solution. Just I, I've actually asked if, like, if, when I feel like, oh, this would be... this would be really, It's one of those where I, I just ask for the permission to. Yeah. Where oh. it's like, is it, mm -hmm. hey, there's a verse. It means a lot to me. Yeah. Can I share it with you? Uh, rather than just... Well, this verse says this, so you need to do it. Just do it. Uh -huh. yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and that's what I mean. It's not saying don't avoid the Bible. Yeah, I'm yeah. not saying avoid it. I'm saying be wise. Don't use the Bible as a means to just say, well, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> uh, Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> yeah, just, just use Jesus because that's Here's not ultimately helpful. <laughs> but when you're in a relationship and they're actually like, is there any? I've had, as a pastor, this is one of the privileges as a pastor, I'll have people regularly me who are struggling through depression, mm -hmm. and they'll say, Pastor Jason, do you have a verse for me, something that I can reflect yep. on? Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Yeah. 
Because they want that. That's not me wielding the sword and going, here's a Bible verse and here's... I'm not the Oprah Winfrey of Bible verses just throwing them at people. <laughs> you get a verse. You get a verse and you get a verse. Person. And usually they're out of context. Yes. Mm-hmm. Usually they're out of context. I can do anything through a verse taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, Renee, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. This thank was so, so much. great having you here. Yes, um, I want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of this. If you found this encouraging, please share it on Facebook. Um, I'm in the process. I think we're going to put some stuff on, uh, on YouTube. Um, the goal of Theology on Tap is, again, to have conversations that are not always easy. This was a little bit different night. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be doing, uh, next month, we're going to be doing another Theology on Tap virtually. Uh, and so I, I hope you'll tune in for that. Thank you so much for joining. Ben, awesome as job as always. Mm-hmm. You're awesome. awesome. And Renee, thank hey, you again. You're yeah, such a blessing. So have a blessed night.